Join me, Dr. Bruce, midway through my 2015 Grand Tour of Eastern Australia. One night, I offered the assembled Aussies a special spiel in an artsy warehouse in the artsy Sydney district of Newtown. I now see this as a sort of serenade, as it was the first time I presented with the aid of a live DJ. Sensac, a.k.a. Richard Barron, artfully spun his dulcet tones to my telling. Being my 53rd birthday, I was in really top spirits that night. So, dear Levity Zone listener, sit back for this first half of a serenade through much of my thought, threaded in a very special way to lift you up from down under. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce the man of the hour. So we're about to hear from Dr. Bruce Damer. Um, uh, in particular, what Bruce is really good at is kind of walking the edge between um, rational science and maybe the more mystical aspects of life. And so he's going to talk to us a bit tonight about his thoughts on how those two things come together. The title of his talk is Monkey Beholds Cosmo Generator Beholds Monkey. Um, so we're going to hear this incredible tale. Following that, there's going to be lots of time for question and discussion. So think of some good stories you'd like to hear Bruce tell us about. We can ask him afterwards. Um, so for now, please do make yourself comfortable. We've put out a whole bunch of new cushions and stuff. So if you're at the back, please feel free to come and squeeze in. There's lots of space for us all. And um, have an excellent time listening to Bruce. And please... Join me in give him, giving him a really warm welcome. Thanks, Dr. Tamer. So, are we good to go? We're good to go. Our, our motors are repairing and our bottoms are occurring in the right place, grounded. So uh, I come to you from the other side, from the other shire. I think of Eastern Australia as being like a shire, like a Middle Earth. Of course, all the Kiwis in the audience will say, of course, we are the Middle Earth, right? <laughs> but Australia is the wildlands. Australia has a Mordor in the center around Alice Springs area. It's got the, the lush jungles. It's got the tree beards. It's got um, the, what's that? The drop. OK, the drop bears. Whatever those are. <laughs> I think that you know Aussies do need to have, you have so much vernacular now that Aussies need subtitling, like if they're on, <laughs> on news programs, you know, just like, what's a bogan? Uh, you know, I'm staying down in Campbelltown, so I'm, you know, now I'm understanding what a bogan is. <laughs> but, and Andrew Jones uh, texted me just before coming here and saying, watch out for the bogans. And we were in some shopping mall surrounded by them. But, uh, so <laughs> I come to you from another shire called Northern California. It sort of stretches into uh, Oregon, Washington, and whatnot. It's a, shri it's a shire where the hobbits have decided that they like their weeds so much that it's becoming legal. So despite Saruman's complaint that, that uh, Gandalf smoked too much of it, Everybody seems to be at the moment. So, yeah, we're, we, next year California will legalize marijuana, and there's going to be stores the size of Costco opening. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a billion dollars in invent, venture capital going into just vaporizer companies. It's just ridiculous. I mean, I mean, what's the, what's the population of Australia? That's the number of smokers in California. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so I bring you a delicious mixture from 
the Haight-Ashbury. I hang out with gra the grandmothers of the Haight-Ashbury. And let me tell you, these women are deep. You know, these women have been through it all. And these women organize themselves. And they're really powerful. So when you hang around, it's called the Women's Visionary Congress. And it's in Northern California. They've had eight conferences, mostly women. I'm allowed to come now and then. But they're sacred, powerful medicine women up there. And then there's, of course, Burning Man, you know, which is a visionary creation. And Burning Man has recreated Silicon Valley. Google's founders met on the playa. <laughs> I met Sergey Brin wearing a condom suit about eight years ago. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he came into the camp and uh, along with Sting and a couple other people. It was quite an interesting scene. But anyway, so Burning Man, you know, consensual temporary autom autonomous zone. So that's what's kind of happening over in that shire. And yet the battles continue and we are losing the elders. We just lost Sasha Shulgin, if you know who he is. You know, and 12 years ago or thereabouts, we lost Terrence McKenna and we lost Tim Leary. But new generations are coming up and they're really powerful new speakers. You know, one of them is our friend Rock Razam, who's greeting me in the Byron Shire on Wednesday, and we're doing a whole workshop there. And Byron Bay is a lot like Santa Cruz, where I'm from. I'm from in the areas up above Santa Cruz. And so those mountains up above Byron are kind of like where, they're my, like the other pole, actually, of where I come from. So I live in the Redwoods. I have a farm with Galen. We have a barn crammed with vintage computers. I've chronicled the whole history of computing. I've collected them all and I've interviewed all the people. I dug through John von Neumann's archives. I've got a Cray supercomputer that William Shatner beamed me out of about six years ago. You know, this, the Captain Kirk. You can watch that on the Discovery Channel. That was a blast. Um, but in one room is Tim, Tim Leary's library and the news archive all the way from the Harvard Crimson papers all the way up. It's an amazing archive. Uh, the chandelier from his house in Beverly Hills, which is all painted crazy, I, like Keith Haring crazy. And it hangs above our events so Tim can listen in. So my vector to use to bring some of that down under, you know, to get underneath you and to uplift you and what I do is we record these things and it goes into my podcast called The Levity Zone. The Levity Zone podcast or salon. So check it out. It'll be there so your voices will be heard there. And why levity? You know, Terence talked about novelty. Remember, novelty, you know. Well, we have enough novelty. We need more levity. Why do we need levity? Because there's a force in the world pushing us down, right? When you wake up in the morning and you turn on the TV, which I don't do anymore, uh, when you just get word on the street, it's not a, a world of levity that's being presented to you, right? Is, and does anybody feel the pressure? Do you, do you feel, I call it the pall that hangs over, and it's especially intense over the United States, this pall. It's like an energy field, it's like a living being. So what I want to do is to tell you a story of where this may have come from. What is the source of this anxiety, deep inner like discomfiture? The source of this panic, what is it? And so what I do is I have a practice I call ENDO, and it stands for endogenous. And all roads, in a sense, meet at Endo. And I recently discovered that what I've been doing since I was nine years old, it actually is something chemical. I've actually verified this. But what Endo is, is how many of you, when you've had a really stimulating day, you know, when you're, say, little, or even now, when you've had a great conversation, or done something, you know, ballsy and, like, jumped out on a bungee cord or something and your whole system is just up and then you try to go to sleep at night and you see flashes appearing just behind your eyelids 
Has anybody seen those sort of flashes and like, or fields? And it's just like, oh my God, look at all this stuff. And you think it's overcharged. You're overcharged, right? You're just kind of, oh, I've just had a big day and uh, you know, I'd like to go to sleep now. And most, you, you go to sleep. Well, I started seeing these things when I was about eight or nine. And it was after our father would read us a chunk of the Lord of the Rings. So he did us this beautiful favor, my brother and I, of reading us the whole Lord of the Rings. I think he did it twice before we went to bed. Now that could give you dread. It could give you, you know, fears about the orcs and the Urukai. But in, for us, it just turned our imaginations on. So when I would close my eyes, I would see these shapes and things moving. And I would say, I love them. They're so cool. I'd, they're amazing. I want to see more, please. So over a period of time, I learned how to shut myself off. I call it, put yourself on the shelf. Try to shut off everything, language, memory, lists, everything until these flashes start changing because I wanted more flashes you know I wanted them to resolve into something and they did and so over the years I learned how to minimize myself down to a crystal sphere that could just barely see it was barely present in the environment and there's a story about that sphere I'll get to later but then what would happen is this whole system would potentiate and it would convert into these washes black and red fractal washes going and then I would concentrate on slowing the washes slow the washes slow slower slower and then they would stabilize and then they would turn into color blotches and I would say we're ready to go we're ready and it would open well I would be piloting over landscapes I'd be traveling at high speed. Stuff would be coming at me. Entities flying across the scene. I was like, oh goody, here we are. <laughs> this is the, the good stuff. And then when I was 14 or 15, I started drawing this stuff. And they were, I called them the weird machines. I started drawing them. And then, as I got older, I thought, I can really live in here. You know, you're, you're bored at school, what do you do? You know, run a movie. You know, was, so I would record these endogenously made experiences. Them. I, I've used the word endogenous for about three or four years now. And I would put them on the shelf like a bunch of DVDs. And I could pull them off and run them again. And I could connect them and edit them together and make a bigger movie. And a bigger and a bigger and a bigger movie. And now what I'm doing is making big, deep movies for science, for designing spaceships, for viewing the Earth from above. It's like all one great, big, wonderful library. Um, so that's my story. That's my practice. And I can get there through yoga, through breath work, through sort of extreme nerding out. <laughs> Uh, so you're so freaking tired and overdone that you just sort of collapse. You collapse the wave function and suddenly you're in the space. And nowadays the space is always running a little bit. And I sometimes deny it and I get into the mode of I'm driving the car and then I see a tree go past and the tree has a certain shine and shape to it and then I boom, I'm in that space, you know. So now I'm in, in this liminal boundary between that magic space running it seems to be running as a continuous program and then the sort of mundane you know but reinsuring dull world of get to get these list things done you know because we all live trapped in lists we all live trapped in lists. does this make sense does it make sense all right so that's the background that's where this stuff comes from so would you I'm just thinking, what would be the way to take off on this? I promised you, where did this come from? I could tell you the deep history. The deep history where we came from as monkeys. Would you like the deep, deep story first, or would you like the powerful recent story? Powerful recent? 
Monkeys. Monkeys? Okay. Monkeys. So, all right, do the monkey. Okay, monkeys win. Monkeys win. So, a friend of mine, a friend of mine runs a big planetarium. He does all the shows. It's in, called the Hayden Planetarium. It's in New York City. He dresses up as Barbie. He cross-dresses. Oh, there goes the, uh, the dynamical system there. Oh, it's a quick save. You know, you, you don't ever see a... Aussies are the fastest things on the planet at saving a beer when it goes over. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, even when you've had a lot of them, you, you, uh, you're good. I think it's like from crawling across the continent for so long, looking for the, not the, Aussies never looked for the oasis, right? It was always for the pub, <laughs> like those cartoons. <laughs> they go right past the water. <laughs> monkeys, monkeys. All right. So um, we... Uh, what was the planet like 300 million years ago? Are there any like paleo people in who study like this? I just am obsessed with studying the phases of the Earth. Anybody know what was happening? If you if you came into orbit 300 million years ago around the Earth, what would you see? Does anybody have, throw it in the air? What would you'd see? The Permian. You'd see the Permian. Fish walking out till Arctic. No dinosaurs yet. Great. Giant mushrooms, yeah, you'd see those guys. They colonize the land first. Uh, but what you'd mostly see is a lot of green slime. You'd see the older guys, the stromatolites, that were around all the edges of the continents that still are around Australia. That's how out of date you guys are, you know? <laughs> Just think about that, you know. You still have stromatolites. The original smokestack polluters are still living in South Australia and Shark Bay in Western Australia. Anyway, I'm going to see them in July. I'm so excited. You can lie down next to them at night and get high on the oxygen they pump out. <clears throat> so anyway, well, I'm going to explain to them, listen, we're putting the CO2 back in, so you guys have a, have a job in the future. Uh, so the continents were green, the coastlines were slimy green and the, the plants had moved on to the land and they were the hyper sea. They were carrying the sea onto the land. They just saw it as a big real estate deal, you know. The plants had taken over. The madre, the Gaian bolus, the plant, planetary plant body. But it was mostly green. It was just green, 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 green. So if you were a cycad, an, an attractive cycad, and you were trying to attract a mate, or you really wanted to get in with that cycad or that huge tree fern over there or such and such, you couldn't get to her. So you couldn't have sex. So what did the plants do? They seduced the insects to allow them to have sex. And how did they do it? The first thing was the pink leaf. The leaf colored pink with the little stamen stuck into it. Pink is the, is the universal color of attraction girls. You've nailed it. So pink, and then over the time that this occurred, there was a point in the angiosperms dominated, and the whole planet went multicolor, it went kind of psychedelic. But then there was this period where, and I kind of like to talk about the planet as having a kind of personality, and I think of it as a woman. And I think of the woman as being made up of all the plants. Because let's face it, everything else is a parasite. You know, everything else is like, we could just not exist and the plants would go on you know we're kind of we're kind of added sugar on the cake really in a way so i kind of like to think of it in the following way that if madre is evolution and evolution is in a hurry evolution has go only got it only had you know three and a half billion years to to condition the atmosphere to generate malt, the citric acid cycle to lots of energy to then colonize the land and do things with bodies, you know, and it's kind of running out of time, right? It, 500 million years from now, no more forests on the continents probably at the rate things are going. So the earth is getting a bald spot, you know. 
the glaciations more severe, the deserts are widening. You know, Earth is running out of juice. So if there is a entity that's saying, we need to make a copy, what is all this life for? It's to make a copy elsewhere. Then I think I call her the Madre. I call her the planetary or the Gaia uh, entity. And it's just useful to do that. Um, so the dinosaurs rise. And the dinosaurs do their thing, but they're the peak of their world. They are the crown. They're big ones, small ones. They filled all the niches, but they're actually not evolving much. They're not, they're not really pushing the state of the art forward. They don't look skyward. They don't build city buses. They don't fly, no, fly to the stars. They don't have language in the way we would think it. So my conceit, my... my uh, vision that I had in an endo trip was that she offed them. She, she said off with their heads one day. And the way she did it was she called a five kilometer asteroid to come in. She talked to her friends, the bacteria, the single celled agents within the asteroid belt and said, come on down, I need to start over. I need a reset, you know, control, alt, delete. But what was living in the rainforest can canopy was our ancestors, our prosimian ancestors. And why do we know that? Because they found a femur bone this long, a femur bone that was this long, which was the bone of all of our, our, our this is our progenitor, the ancestor of the, the primates, the monkeys, the lemurs, the great, you know, the great apes, us. And so science has figured out that their uh, were these insectivores called us, the prosimians, living in the rainforest canopy, running along limbs in colonies, great colonies. Can you imagine them, like ant colonies? We were two inches long, we had curly tails, so that we could catch a limb and we could, so we wouldn't fall. And can you imagine the floods of them pouring along these limbs, going into holes, all as a tribe, as a group? This was us. This was us. And at night, we would sleep in these tight balls. This is the insectivore lifestyle. By day, we would hunt the dragonfly, was the big, you know, the big steak on the barbie. You know, that was the, they were big back then too, so you'd need a whole troop, one to grab a wing, another to grab another wing, and one to sort of whack away at the head, and you know, all that sort of thing, and bring, bring in the dragonfly. Then we would eat leaves, we would eat flowers, we would do all that. And then we would find fruit. We found sweet things, tree sap and fruit. So we had a burger, fries, and a shake diet. So if you feel guilty passing that McDonald's and going in when your you know, vegan vegetarian friends are watching you, don't feel so bad. That is the diet of the insectivore. <laughs> burger, fries, and a shake. So. I did an endo vision. When I heard it, when I read about this femur bone, I went into endogenous space and I, I dove in to this world and said, what was life like? What happened? What happened to these creatures that made us? And what came was suddenly I was in the dark. I was the observer sphere and there was the ball of them. It was a particular colony. They were all in their nice sleepy ball. It was at dawn. And there was one of them pulling herself out of the ball. She was like a teenage prosimian. And she, I called her overdrive for reasons that you'll <laughs> understand later. So she unwrapped herself from the ball very carefully. And she was climbing out on the limb. Why? Because she saw the slight glint of tree sap that had come out of that tree, out of that the phloem and xylem of that tree during the night, and she wanted to, to suck that down. She wanted that for herself, because that was property of the community at dawn, but if she could only get there, and she could get the majority of it. Why? Because it made you high. Get the picture? So she goes out there, and you can see this in the insectivore world, the, the opportunist, 
the explorer, the seeker. Overdrive was that. She had a brain the size of a pea, but she had initiative. So she gets to this sap and she takes her prosimian lips and puts it on the tree sap and she's sucking it down. It's instantly charging up her whole neuronal bundle. It's instantly putting her in an elevated state. And then she looks back at the, com the colony and says, I hope they don't notice me because I'll get busted. You know, they're going to come and really come down on me if they see me doing this. But no matter. So the other eye looks forward on the limb, and what does it see? This vague color pattern, squares. So she's studying that, and oh, that's interesting. I don't know if I've seen that before. And what's going on is underneath the limb is the head of a large snake, a hunter. That head is moving very slowly underneath her and the ball of sap. And unless she recognizes that those patterns are her doom, the head will come and snap her down, snap her ass down. So this happened over and over and over for 30 million years. This was the, the encounter, the fundamental encounter. Did the elevated state and did her cognition and her growing ability to d discern color allow her to just in the right moment leap up and run to safety and warn the colony too for that matter this happened over and over and over until the madre the forest that was set up this thing had created vision had created an animal us that could do amazing things it could see in 3d it could see in discrete color patterns like no other animal before snap jump snap jump snap jump snap jump the driver the driver that gave us vision that gave us vision so roll the clock forward and here we are there was a moment uh, where when the madre ordered the airstrike and this is my funny version. She pulled up her lawn chair saying, okay, off with the dinosaurs' heads. I've had it. I've picked these prosimians. I love them dearly. Why? Because through their eyes, I can see me. They are the first entity that can see the rainforest and show me who I am. So I'm just going to knock off these dinosaurs who basically pick them off as popcorn when they fall to the forest floor. And we're going to start with them again. And so she orders the airstrike and gets nervous at the last minute and orders a slightly bigger one. It comes in, and my friend Carter has modeled this with a thousand computers. What happened? This thing comes in and hits at Chichlov and near where Mexico and Yucatan are. It's so powerful, this bolide, that it goes through the Earth's crust into the magma. And as the Madre watches, she says, oh, that felt really good. Now, that was made my made my, build, my eon, and up comes the sheet wall of, 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 of molten earth, this, this incredible curtain wall that's about 3K high. That comes down, and the tsunamis are now moving around the planet. But unfortunately for the Madre, something else came up, and that was the droplet. So the droplet, the asteroid, the bolide was big enough and powerful enough to generate the droplet that comes up 60 miles across and as she watched this go to orbit she realized I have fucked myself completely today because why that thing is going to go to orbit split into molten mountains and it's going to come crashing down those mountains are going to come down they're going to impact the atmosphere and blow it apart they're going to set it on fire and then when they hit the forest they're going to set those on fire the temperature was at 500 Fahrenheit within an hour all over the world. So the Madre went dark. The Madre, it was, she was burned. And just before she went dark, she said, I remember why we were doing this. It was for those little cute prosimians to go forward. But I forgot they live in the rainforest canopy, which is now all on fire. What was I thinking? 
So, boom, gone. After three million years, because the Earth had such vitality, it had incredible vitality left, the forest roared back. The forest roared back, pole to pole, and the Madre came back to consciousness, and we were still there. How did we make it? Did we climb in some hollow log or something? <laughs> One of the great miracles of history by which we made it through that. The dinosaurs survived as birds, supposedly. That's why I still eat chicken, because it's payback time, folks. It's payback time. It's karmically okay. <laughs> anyway, can you imagine roasting a, what is the big dinosaur, the, uh, the Tyrannosaurus? Can you imagine, that would taste like turkey. So can you imagine roasting that on a spit? You know, biggest Thanksgiving we Americans could ever conceive of. Imagine how big those thigh legs are. But, huh? Burning Rex. <laughs> so, let me grab a drink of aqua here. So does this make sense? How do we survive the conflagration? We won't know, but what I'll tell you today is the serpent is alive and well. The serpent is called technology. It's called media. It's called the pixels on the screen, which mesmerize enough, us enough that if an ancient from the ancient world was watching you on the cell phone, they would. some of them would say, when they hold this glowing box up, it's like Medusa, it turns them to stone. It turns them into stone. So we, you know, cats will follow, you know, a flying bird on the screen for a while, but we're the only ones that are such suckers for this stuff because we were co-evolved with it to be that way. So the serpent of technology is coiling around the earth. It's coiling around humanity and around the earth. The serpent has basically is, is, is in a, a hungry state and we feed it. And it's also a glorious thing. It's a glorious creation. And more about that later, if I can, t I will tie this all back together. So that's the old story. Would you like the middle story? The recent powerful story? All right. I'm gonna bring something out here that I brought for you. It's in this little baggie. And it's not what you might think it would be. <laughs> there, uh, let's roll our clocks to what was known as the Upper Paleolithic. The Upper Paleolithic was sort of a bit in between ice ages and it had interesting characters like the Iceman. Do you remember the Iceman? The guy that froze up at the top of the Alps? He was, he was a shaman that carried a little baggie like this. He had, he had rabbit's feet in this baggie and probably mushrooms or something like that. And he was climbing over the Alps on some mission. And this is during the Upper Paleolithic, during the, the period when it was all villages. Villages, shamans, little local agriculture, kind of, you know, not many and much in the way of big cities, no big religions. It was this sort of this chill time. It was kind of like the Shire, you know, it's kind of like Hobbiton anyway. So this guy got offed. He actually got bashed in the head at the top of the Alps between Austria and Italy. And his, he fell. And the guy that knocked him out sort of left him there. And the snows came and it preserved him in the ice. It's amazing. But he was a creature. He was a sacred, holy seeker. He was like over the overdrive of the Upper Paleolithic. He was climbing over the Alps. I mean, it, it took some balls to do this. And the time before antibiotics and medical care, you know, every trip you took could be your last. So that's the Upper Paleolithic. Roll forward and you see the beginnings of male dominance culture. You had Shatal Hayuk in, in Turkey, which was an incredible city of like 5,000 souls that had no central avenue and people climbed through holes in the tops of the houses which were sort of built together uh, 
and the holes were smoke holes and it was like living in a different world but in a city and there were cave paintings on the sides of these houses on the insides and the ancestors buried under the floor so Shackle Chantel Hayuk was this weird transition thing it's a city but it's all like hunter-gatherers <laughs> pretty weird huh it fell and then rising in the Near East was the bull cult the first fully male dominated culture in Mesopotamia that we don't know where the people came from but they worshiped the bull and the bull pull, pulled the plow and the plow in their language was the penis cutting the vulva of the earth and creating agriculture displacing women as the gardeners as the as the sowers and the gardeners women were being displaced and domesticated as the bull had been domesticated, women were the next to be domesticated. So this was going on in the Near East and you know, really all over the world. This transition was going on to high tech, cities, trade, surpluses, war to defend surpluses. This was all cranking on, but something else was happening, something else a little bit more hopeful because if this thing that I'm now going to tell you about hadn't happened, we'd still be in that world of kings, the world of battles and kings and defending surplus and the bull and the agriculture. What was happening starting in, in Greece and all over the Mediterranean were mystery cults or mystery schools. What mystery schools were, were tribal initiations. They grew out of the Upper Paleolithic when those people were, were wise to this. They recognized, hmm, if you've got young teenagers, especially boys, and you don't initiate them and level them down, level their bad tendencies down, you know, we call it bullying today, you get trouble later. So the elders of the community have to initiate. And this happens in Africa, happens in, in tribal cultures still. The initiation is key to long-term health of a civilization. So these grew into the mystery schools. There was the Crete, the, the ancient, uh, the, the Minoans had them. They were in North Africa, but the greatest of them all was in Greece. And it was a day's walk from Athens. And what I have in my hand is a piece from the temple at Eleusis. And I'll bring this out to, to show you why it's important to see this. But before I show it to you, can't really see it, but there's a, a man's head there with nice long hair, a ponytail, and a really nice expression. And it's a Greek, it's meant to represent, from an old vase, a celebrant in a uh, fantastical festi festival, of which there were many. So this is like the burner, the burner of uh, 1500 BC. <laughs> But inside here is what looks like a shell. Can you see that? It's a shell on one side, and then there's some stone on the other side. Can you, can you see that in the light? Yeah. I hold it up. You trust me that it's there here. If I hold it right against this, now can you see it? No. Uh, no. <laughs> I'll hold it up. I'll put it right on my forehead there. And I'll stand and... Yeah, all right. You see it in the imaginations. It's, it's a wonderful thing. This was taken from basically the lower part of the temple, from the bench seat. And this bench seat was a very important place. My fantasy is that Aristotle could have peed on this, for example, or Claudius, the great emperor-to-be that went to Eleusis to be initiated, could have sat on here, or Cleopatra, perhaps. Uh, she, uh, she set down her purse on this. But this, this touched these incredible beings. And the story of Eleusis was you could be a slave, you could be a merchant, you could be a high noble, you could be a, a bent old man, and you had the right to go once in your life to Eleusis to be initiated. There we are. There's the pot. 
Aristotle a member of the Eleusinian History School? They all went. They all went. And what I would argue is that Eleusis and the other mystery schools were the liminal boundary between the Upper Paleolithic, between the Stone Age and civilization. That civilization rose because of this. Why? Because those few recountings by people like Plato talk about it as being a transformative contact with the infinite that completely leveled you where you were able to face the greatest fears in you and, and defeat them and pull through them and then have contact with you know, what they wouldn't call God, they called the cosmos. That this was so far beyond words that it couldn't be ever put into words. And in fact, it almost never was because it was secret and under penalty of death to reveal the secrets at Eleusis. That was the rule for 1,700 years. So the two, two or three families that ran Eleusis around 1500 BC decided to up the ante and they built the festival site and the site got built out and built out and built out until you had this, the Telesterion, a building, massive building that could house a thousand people at once to do the ceremony. So the people would arrive in Athens by boat from all over the Mediterranean or they would walk, which is a lot more risky. And then they would go through training. They would go through the lesser mysteries in the Athenian fold. They would be de you know, bathed and baptized, in a sense, in the oceans. They would go through all of this testing to qualify for the greater mysteries. And then the whole of Athens would celebrate them, that they were going to be converted from raw born entities, the monkey, and they would emerge from Eleusis being human beings. Human beings that could take the civilization forward, that would be honored and respected for having done that. And so when the, le when the greater mysteries began in September, the initiates walked in a long column out of Athens up to the Eleusinian plain. And as they walked up there, they passed fields of barley and the barley in the Eleusinian plain, some of it had a blue-purple smut on it. Because barley can get that way. And if you make beer with this stuff, which is called ergot, it can poison you. It's pretty powerful stuff. And in fact, it was the basis for the discovery of LSD by Albert Hoffman and the synthesis of LSD from ergotamine. So, ergot rise and the poisoning ergot ergot poisoning was well known thousands died of this stuff so that was you were passing that on vessels and remnants of the actual Eleusis temple they're holding platters with mushrooms on them serving people or showing people mushrooms so, so there's a clue here and in fact Albert Hoffman Carl Ruck and Gordon Wasson wrote a book about this way back in the early 80s saying we have solved the mystery. They used a hallucinogenic potion that they had perfected. That was what was known as the Kaikion, the drink that people took on the ninth day. We have solved it. It's a bombshell that hit the, the classicists who had been fascinated by Eleusis for 300 years. But these guys coming in, Carl Ruck is no slouch. I mean, he's a Harvard classicist, very respected. So these books are fantastic if you get, get a hold of them. But back to Eleusis. So the thousand people, the initiates, are walking across the plain, and they come to this narrow bridge. And the bridge is still there. The foundations are still there. And they walk across the bridge. And the bridge is so narrow and tight that it sort of compresses everybody. No wheeled traffic can go there. And on either side of the bridge are the townsfolk from Eleusis, screaming and shouting catcalls at the initiates that are coming up. They're all wearing kind of rag-like common garb. So they're being knocked down to one level. You could be a slave. You could be the future emperor of Rome. You, for that period of time, you were 
a, uh, an uninitiated person. Didn't matter what your future was, what your pedigree was, what your power was. So a villager might say, hey you, you've got a really ugly nose. Or, hey you proud, young, you know, athletic type, you're going to be a bent old man like me someday. So why don't you give me some respect? You know, so th they would knock them down. They would continue to walk and they would come up to the temple complex. You can go there today, it's surrounded by oil refineries, the, the products of, in a sense, of the Eleusinian vision, the bad products. Um, but there's a museum there. But the Telesterion is this enormous hall. And they would, in the ninth day, all congregate in the hall and suddenly coming in from one side were women dancing with these wonderful round amphorae on their heads and they would dance through the crowd. This is from the remnants of what we know. Smoke would appear, olfactory things. Music would be played such that the music would vibrate across the Telsterion and vibrate every cell in your body. The Incans built such rooms too, incredible sonic space rooms. So you're already transformed by the setting and then would come out these vessels with the kaikion, and people would all drink of the kaikion, and then were instructed to sit on the bench seats around the, the, the borders of the telesterion from which this comes, and wait. And what they saw next, we don't know. We only know it by sort of second hand, almost the poetic comments, but the backstory is the story of Demeter, the great mother that brings spring and brings life to the earth, and her daughter, Persephone, who was kidnapped and taken to Hades, to the underworld, and Demeter searched for hate for Persephone and her grief and her coming to terms with her loss of her daughter, and then the daughters return. The daughters return uh, with a new child and the rebirth of the world. So that's the backstory, but what is described by the Aristotles, the emperors, the writers, the poets, is a light came into the space, and the light was the light of the infinite. It was the most powerful thing they'd ever seen. It would leave an impression on them that would last their entire lives. It was something so great. It was something so great. And then they would leave after the ceremony. And these people didn't have cell phones, so you know, as they left the the temple plane, they didn't, weren't able to get Wi-Fi and get back into their minds. They could contemplate this. They may have a month of travel to get back to where they came from. They could integrate the experience. And what, how did they integrate the experience? They brought us civilization. They brought us the brilliance and the genius of civilization. They invented the aqueduct. They created the scientific academy. They wrote the greatest poems. They created logic. They created the polity, the, the Congress and the Senate, trading systems, language systems, basically everything we still use. They didn't give us cell phone networks, but they gave us pretty much the basis, the Roman grid, the layout of cities, everything. And then what happened to Eleusis? What happened to Eleusis has been discovered in the last hundred years. Uh, coming down from the north uh, in the year 396, it's estimated, was Alaric. Alaric was a powerful chieftain of the old Upper Paleolithic, the Germanic tribes. He was leading a, a huge raiding party, more like an army. Alaric and his forebears had sacked Rome several times. They had pretty much they were raiding and stealing the fruits of, of labor of civilization and bringing it back. And then the people of Rome would try to recover. There were periods of time where the people of Rome would simply get all their money together and pay, the, the, pay these raiding parties to go away, you know, pay them off so they could get a few more years of, of peace. But Western Rome was just getting hammered and hammered and hammered. And Rome had died and been suffocated by oligarchs by opportunist governors that would steal the money out of the public coffer and would get into a region and line their pockets. So very much like when you see corruption today, Rome was falling. 
It was, it was tumbling. It had been totally gutted. So what happened to Eleusis? The Alaric's forces are coming in from the north and from the east, from Anatolia, are coming the Christians. The Christians. But these are 4th century Christians. These are Pauline Christians. These are Christians who've come out of of a century, almost a century of Nice, the councils of Nicaea. And if you read the histories of the councils of Nicaea, where they basically corporatized Christianity long after Jesus' passing and long after the loss of things like the Gnostic texts, Constantine decided to corporatize Christianity and make it into a state religion. And they had these councils. And the, the, the skullduggery at these councils between Western bishops and Eastern bishops and bishops planting prostitutes in the other bishops' cells to get them kicked out. You know, all that sort of stuff. The bureaucratic mumbo jumbo, which led to the formation of the, the Western Apostolic Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church was split because they couldn't agree. They, they, they were screaming at each other. If you know about that history of the formation of these organizations, you would never be a member their roots are it's just so rude it's so ugly so the christians coming in from anatolia were black robed zealots who thought who were basically um, obsessive reductionist logician um, mentality almost like a you know a puritanical mentality and they were described in text at the time and they came in and they met alaric's group on the road they said, it's a good thing we met you, people of the Upper Paleolithic, because we need your muscle. We're headed to this place called Eleusis, and you can smash the temple for us. And they did. So what replaced culture from that point on was a state-organized religion without the variety of the multi deitic uh, celebrations of Rome but a state religion with a taxation structure, but more importantly, with a worldview that said, you have no right and you, in your lifetime to have contact with God or some higher power. We have reserved that right. We have layers of local ministers, and then we have our bishops, and then we have our popes. And you have to work your whole lifetime and pay dues into the afterlife and, and watch your P's and Q's, and you may be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and that's why sex is now and sex is shameful, and the whole structure, you can list, list it all. So I posit to you that from that point on, we fell into an inferior culture, and the inferior culture wasn't even able to maintain the technology that came out of civilization. The Britons forgot how to make bricks for 300 or 400 years. They didn't know how to make bricks. You know, so this whole thing came crashing down. So, but the structures of civilization that still support Sydney, harbors, boats, roads, you know, ways of moving water, you know, ways of communicating, ways of organizing are from the period of Eleusis. So the culture that replaced it, what was its primary uh, property. The primary property was uninitiated humans. What did that mean? That somebody who was a pretty good schoolyard bully was going to have a shot all the way through to emperordom without ever having been challenged, without ever having any irony and any questioning and any, any initiation. So in a sense, if you could see it as a juvenility extended into adulthood, this characterized the whole civilization and still does today. When you think about how could our leaders do such things, well, they've never been initiated. They've never had a contact with something more powerful than them. They have just continued to do the schoolyard thing all the way through because initiation has been so forgotten as an incredibly valuable thing in, in civilization. So what I'd say to you also in closing of this more recent story is that when you meet in circles, when you have yoga, when you have vipassana, very intense kinds of things, 
you do breath work, when you have women's circles, men's circles, when you go to the wilderness, survival things, you go to drink ayahuasca, for example, you do the elixirs, I call them, that is a craving for initiation. That is a craving for your own healing, but it is also a return to that which we lost, that we know we need back. So initiation is on its return. We are in the Eleusinian return now. And what does that mean? Thank you. Uh, Burning Man, you know, is one such place. And of course, it's kind of a mess and crazy things happen. I mean, we have a camp that helps people that are in trouble. You know, that's what our, our camp does, one of its functions. But Burning Man is this incredible seven-day experience that by the time you're reaching the point where they're burning the man or they're burning the temple, it's even more powerful moment, people are in one carrier wave. People are in, in love, kind of like what happened at Rainbow Serpent last week. People get into that carrier wave. And they have had adventure after adventure after adventure, mostly looking in people's eyes. When they arrive, they don't look in people's eyes. When they're leaving, everybody's making the eye contact. It's fantastic. And when the man burns, you know, the thing is 10 stories tall now. A friend of mine did the last design, and it, it's, it's massive now. Every year it gets more beautiful, more massive, and more purgative, and more representative. You know, and the temple itself is a place you go and you write the names of those who have died. The temple is full of crying people. It's full of deep contemplation, deep soul healing, deep loss. And when the temple burned the week before 9-1-1, Galen had watched. Galen and I were there, and there was an enormous windstorm that blew through, and they couldn't start the temple fire, the temple burn. Everyone got their entire face and body became white. We were all like incredible ghosts and waiting for the temple to burn. And then it did. And there was a collective grieving, grieving for everything. And a week later, the World Trade Centers were slammed and they came down. And all that dust came on the people in New York and they were coated in the same dust. And so we always look back to the 2001 temple as a path of hope, because we knew when the World Trade Centers were hit, it would lead to this madness of juvenile, uninitiated people with, with no empath empathic sense on all sides would lead to a decade of destruction that's still going on, because the response was not the response of any kind of an enlightened person. I remember the Dalai Lama, after the 911 attacks, who is an enlightened person, came out and said, you might want to ask that if someone comes up to you in the street who you don't even know, gives you a shiner, knocks you down, you should get up and instead of attacking them or looking for their brethren to go after, ask why, what did you do to create that force and that enmity? That is the wise and informed way. But the dialogue got changed. The media was used. The serpent coiled ever tightly. We were made afraid. We were manipulated by these forces. And if you sat in the White House, as friends of mine did, in the days after 9-1-1, what they decided to do was set up the White House theater and put people in it, you know, from Condoleezza Rice to everybody who showed up. And they simply showed the attack over and over and over again on that screen until people were bloody in their minds. They were unable to think. They just went over and over and over again. It was like, we're using this to program you for our agenda. It's nothing about truth. It's nothing about forgiveness. It's nothing about finding out what we did that made this happen, our part in it. So it was a programming thing. So the, the monkey is sitting and it's watching the screen, it's watching that snake, because every time those towers were hit, it was like the two fangs. We're cutting into you more deeply. We're gonna control you. We're poisoning you to go and support our program. You know, we knew where that went. So it's a bit of a downer, but the upper is 
we see this truth, we see what's happening. No one is to blame. One of the things that Terence used to say that I would always appreciate is he said, the horrible news is, the frightening news is, no one is in control. There is no conspiracy, there's no cabal, there's no Illuminati, no one is driving. It's all a response to crisis, and, and ever-mounting crisis. No one has a plan. But what that shows is that it's very weak. The leadership and the vision is extremely weak. Another fellow that I went to see last year, his name is Bob Woodward, and Bob Woodward gave us a talk. And Bob Woodward was the journalist who outed Richard Nixon for Watergate, right? Bob Woodward faced power and wrote it through at risk of life and limb to bring down a president, right? This guy doesn't have fear and he knows the presidency well. And what he told us in this talk was he'd just been at the Obama White House so he could observe this current crop and potential future crop. And he turned to Obama at one point and said, buddy, you have no clue how to wield the power of the presidency. You have no internal energy and surety and certainty. You're this weak flip-flop uh, conciliator and it's tearing apart any of the good you could do. He's not a Lyndon Baines Johnson. But at lunch, he sat next to Hillary, and at one point Hillary, you know, elbows Bob Woodward. This is sort of not a smart thing to do. You know, elbows him, turns to him, and in her Hillary voice said, you know, Bob, you fake it till you make it. And Bob said, these are the kinds of people we have. You know, and we think of them as sort of the good crop. You know, there could be worse ones. There were worse ones, you know. George W. Bush could never have gotten a pilot's license because of his addictions, you know. So how did he get into the job that he got into? No initiation, no one watching over. So the good news is we see this truth now. We see the game that's going on, and we see that it's weak. You can push it over. One example, and this is an example you won't have heard probably from anyone else because it's so kind of dull, really. Do you know who Angela Merkel is? Angela Merkel? Angela Merkel? No, the German Chancellor? The story of Angela Merkel has never been put forward as a powerful story, but it is. I just read the whole story of her. She was an East German nuclear scientist in East Germany, where to survive, you had to be very careful. You had to navigate very, very carefully, very observant woman. What she did after unification is she joined politics. She joined like the main party and she watched as she described the vain males fighting over the future of Germany, vain males and, and stupid males. She was sort of shocked by the low quality of these leaders. And she watched and she gradually moved herself into position. Some of them fell away on their own. Some of them attacked her. And she was just a, you know, a faithful party functionary. She was extremely brilliant. She, could, she was a scientist. She could pull together so many things. She was also very pragmatic, very non-ideological. But she was incredibly astute. And one day, she basically put her finger out and pushed over the last vain male and became chancellor, and she's chancellor for a very long period, and she's totally transformed Germany. So when Putin's doing something, there's Angela Merkel saying, hmm, another one, you know? I'll just, I'll push in the boundary that way. Greece has done its thing, and the Eurozone is collapsing. She's just there as the center, keeping it together, but not giving in. She, and she has a, what they call in Germany, a a, a soup bowl haircut, you know? <laughs> no stylishness, no vanity, no pretensions of power in Angela Merkel. So I would, I would say to you that Angela Merkel, how, however dull she is, she is a better future. She's a pragmatist. She is doing all the things not for personal reasons. She's brilliant. She's low key. And she's a woman leading Germany. You know, 
and none of these men survived. Uh, they, any, they crossed her, they didn't survive. Within a few years, they were gone. So that's the recent story. Would you all like to take a bit of a break now? A bit of a break, and then we'll come back. You're welcome. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll catch the second half of the Sydney Serenade in the next podcast. Also stand by in the coming weeks for more recordings from the 2015 Levity Tour Down Under. My warmest thanks go out to Vince Polito and the Sydney Spore for hosting and emceeing the evening, the good folks running Create or Die Studio, where the serenade was held, DJ Richard Barron, a.k.a. Sensac, and a special acknowledgement of Craig Brown, a.k.a. Slinky and Snootis, for his truly artful lighting and photography that generated this episode's cover art. Another shout-out goes to Bo Millward for his help with audio editing, and as always, thanks Jacob Amon for his artful work on our cover art.